We're going to get started. I'm sure that people will be trickling in. If you're in here now, um, find a place to sit if you haven't found a seat yet. Um, so you are here at the, what do we call this after all? Operationalizing bridging, <laughs> building a bigger we. And um, it's great that it came just after the panel and the morning discussion. How many of you came from that? Before I start, um, my name is Olivia Reis. I work at the Haas Institute. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with um, several people here at this panel, meeting new ones, um, new projects um, through the Blueprint for Belonging project and a national project around civic engagement. Both of them are looking at narrative, um, but specifically at how we build a bigger we. And one of the good things um, about working on this project is that it takes us to answering the question, what do we do? And for several years now, we've been talking about creating and advancing a narrative that takes down the dominant narrative that kind of is building this individualistic, consumeristic society. and so on and so forth, and, and then people say, so great, now what? And we've been talking about advancing a more aligned, cohesive kind of strategy to confront these forces that are um, shaping not only this country, but we're seeing it in other countries and globally down these scary roads. And, um, but it is nice to know that there are um, opportunities, there are projects, there's efforts, um, to not only address the structural conditions that demonstrate polarization, um, toxic fear that we see in our politics, um, there's projects and there's strategies and efforts, and, and we have several of them here today that we're gonna that we're gonna learn about. And the way we enter it is by trying to understand the role that identity plays in how we construct a larger we. And so um, we've heard some about that this morning. We're going to show this video again because it's just going to set us up and put it kind of at the front of our minds again. Of all the forces shaping politics and power around the world, perhaps none are more important than our sense of who we are and who we are becoming. We are in a period of accelerated change in at least four areas, globalization, technology, the environment, and demographic change. We can only process so much change in a short period of time without experiencing anxiety, which is a normal biological reaction. But how we respond to this anxiety is social. Our response is greatly shaped by the stories presented by leadership and through culture. These stories speak to our deepest values and our core beliefs about who we are, many of which operate at the subconscious level. We can respond to these changes either as a threat or as an opportunity. The first response is breaking. The second is bridging. Breaking can create a deep fear of other groups, making it easier to accept false stories of us versus them. Breaking perpetuates isolation, hardens racism, and builds oppressive systems while driving our politics and institutions toward anti-democratic and inhumane practices. The other response is bridging which calls on us to imagine a larger, more inclusive we. When we bridge, we see demographic change and our diverse identities as positive and enhancing who we are. Bridging calls on us to engage in healthy dialogue and requires us to listen deeply. Bridging does not mean abandoning your identity. Bridging means acknowledging our shared humanity, rejecting that there is a them, and moving toward a future where there is instead a new us. But when we bridge, we not only open up to others, we also open up to changes within ourselves, where we can participate in creating a society built on belonging. Um, the way I see it is that we're seeing kind of breaking in a lot of places, whether it's at the kind of local or even neighborhood or community level, perhaps we've experienced that. And it's not that it's new, um, but it's, it's being manipulated more. And it's being used to inform government and power. And, um, 
And the way we see uh, how we build a defense or a strategy against that is by building a bigger we. So, I mean, a couple of things, I, uh, points to make is, is how we see ourselves allows us or creates barriers between who we talk to and who we bridge with. And then we is not something that is stable. It's not something that's static. It's dynamic. It can change. And so that means by the work that we do, we can change who we're becoming as a society. It doesn't mean to leave behind who we are. It doesn't mean you have to check your history and your legacy and your people at the door. It means you bring that in with you, but then you see yourself and other people's struggles as well. And that's not easy work, and there's no one way to do that. There's a lot of ways to do that. I think that the way we do that also changes. And so we have several um, amazing projects that, um, and groups and organizations and kind of frameworks that we've brought and assembled here together to help strike that conversation. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Gerald Lenoir, who will present the panel. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, you guys are alive, huh? <laughs> you enjoying the conference so far? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for coming to this workshop. We appreciate it. Uh, we think that these are, it's a very important concept of bridging and how we create uh, shared identities. Uh, this session will look at very practical applications of the bridging framework. Uh, that are occurring in the present day. Uh, so these are just not concepts. Uh, these are being practiced in very real ways. Uh, and uh, the presenters that you'll hear from come from different fields and diverse backgrounds. And they'll provide narratives of bridging across race, class, religion, ethnicity, and geographic context. Uh, so we're very excited to hear from our presenters. I'm going to introduce them one by one, and then they'll come up one by one to uh, I'll introduce all of them, and they'll come up one by one in this order. Victor Suarez is someone we've been working with uh, very closely in California Calls, a statewide network of over 30 groups. Uh, and uh, he is the strategic communications coordinator for California Calls. And we have Mina Girgis, am I pronouncing your name right? From the Nile Project, Executive Director of the Nile Project, uh, bringing music and culture in the geogra geographical and ecological foundational analysis uh, to the Nile River uh, Project. Then we have Marlene Bastien, our sister from the Family Action Network Movement in Miami, Florida, on strategies of bringing Haitians and African American communities together in Miami. And finally, we have Nipun Mehta, the founder of Service Space. So each one of them will explain what their organizations are about and what, what their uh, practices are around bridging. So we'll start with Victor Suarez. Please welcome us. Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. Yes. We're going to bear with us with some technical uh, difficulties. Um, but I'll share a little bit more about myself and about California Calls. Um, California Calls is an alliance of 31 organizations in 14 That's counties right in California. One. We're a big and complex state with a lot of contradictions. So we're trying to figure out a lot of those contradictions in the work that we do. Um, we have a supported base of 700,000 voters that are with us on the issues and are turning out. Um, our main battle in 2020 is going to be around systemic tax reform. If you're all from California, you've heard about Prop 13, and so we're working to reform that in 2020. Uh, yeah, shout out, shout out. So, a little plug for schools and communities first. Um, the key question for us at California Calls is figuring out this key question about operationalizing the bridging narrative. So the question we're trying to figure out as a collective is, can we inspire a collective identity among our supportive voters? Can we then expand it to voter networks? And can we motivate deeper levels of civic engagement that go beyond voting? That's a big question, right? And so for us, 
the way we're trying to answer that is through We Are California. So We Are California is a brand, is the result of two years of exploration and development. Um, and it's in a brand and identity that's de designed to go deeper into voter networks and build a visible, active voter base. Uh, we have a field element, right? We have a narrative element, but we also have a digital organizing element. And it's really this tension between bridging and breaking that we've been learning a lot about. Um, you know, how can we juxtapose the power of the majority that we have as Californians versus the power of the billionaires uh, and the special interests? And so in collaboration with the Haas Institute, one of the projects that we worked in or worked on in the lead up to the fall uh, 2018 midterms was this PSA. And it's really this attempt to operationalize this narrative. How can we have a digital expression of We Are California and how can we bring this narrative to life? And so I'll play the PSA and then I'll share a couple of learnings that we had from the PSA. <laughs> They say we're lost, wandering, with no direction, no identity, no purpose. They say we're selfish, entitled, linked, but disconnected. They say we're confused, divided. More interested in turning up and tuning out. They say we don't know the first thing about God. Family. Country. Or love. They say we're a danger. A nuisance. Dreamers. A hashtag. But we say enough is enough. We're the future. And it doesn't matter what they say. It matters what we say. Thank you. So for us, that PSA really intertwined a lot of the work that we were trying to do. Um, so for us, the challenge was how do we uh, combine this bridging narrative with the identity of California and the new California voter? And the PSA really was meant to challenge a lot of assumptions that people have about young voters and their attitudes about voting. And so what were the results? So we were able to reach uh, over 775,000 voters in the lead up to the midterms. Uh, so we deployed digital ads in strategic counties where we were door knocking, where we were calling voters. And so we were really marrying these two narratives together, right? The narrative at the doors in person, but also the online narrative together. Um, for us, the conversation online was super interesting. I know people say never read the comments online, but I read all the comments. And then to me that reflected a hunger for something different. Something that goes outside of the partisan division that we see all the time in our politics and something that comes together around bridging. And it really underscored for us the importance of bringing together the creative experts, right? Bringing the digital organizers, bringing the field organizers together in one room to bring a narrative to life and to really operationalize a brand. And so we think that that's something that's applicable not just in California, but across the country. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So my name is Mina. I'm from Egypt. And uh, I have been living in the States for about 20 years. In 2011, a revolution happened in Egypt, and speaking of operationalizing bridging, revolutions are an incredible way of oper operationalizing bridging. Um, I n never felt I belonged growing up in Egypt. Uh, like most Egyptians, I felt like I'm a second-class citizen. I don't know who are the first-class citizens because there are no white people over there, but um, you know, you, you don't feel like you really belong when you don't vote, where you don't really, where, when you're not giving a voice. Um, and then when the Arab Spring happened, it was kind of like this big can of belonging that exploded on all of us. And we could all see a sliver of hope, like this is a place where we can belong. And amazing things happened. I don't know if you followed what was happening there, but uh, people started like, I mean, if you haven't been to Cairo, it's not a very clean place, but people started 
uh, cleaning the streets, doing things that are a bit irrational. And uh, the only way I could explain it, being in the square, was this kind of fountain of belonging that people felt. And it was, you know, erupting after so many years of repression. Um, and it was beautiful, but it was very short-lived. Um, people couldn't believe they could belong, and um, and then they were basically given a um, a challenge. You know, you're going to have to basically win this revolution if you want to continue this, and we lost. Uh, but in the process, uh, a lot of people started revising their maps of belonging, revising their sense of community. And uh, the Nod Project was just a byproduct of that. I went back in 2011 and I was trying to figure out what to do as an ethnomusicologist in a revolution. And um, when I came back to San Francisco, a friend of mine invited me to an Ethiopian concert. And I realized that I never, I've never seen Ethiopian music growing up in Egypt. This is something I get to see here in California where there are lots of Ethiopians in Oakland. But um, my friends that I grew up with in Egypt don't know that Ethiopians and Egyptians have so much in common. Um, we have happened to have a river in common, the Nile, um, the longest river in the world. The reason why we don't know that is because we're separated by Sudan that's going into its own Arab Spring today as we speak. Um, and at the time that Egyptians were so worried about the political future of their country, uh, Ethiopia started building uh, the largest hydroelectric dam in Africa on the Blue Nile. Um, the Nile is an interesting river. I didn't know any of that, by the way. This is, I discovered all of this when I started digging into the Nile because I'm an ethnomusicologist. I'm not a geographer or a hydrologist. Um, the Nile st starts in Lake Victoria and also starts in Ethiopia. The Blue Nile that starts in Ethiopia supplies about 85% of the water that goes to Sudan and Egypt, even though it looks much shorter. So when Ethiopia starts building a dam on the Blue Nile, this means that most of the water coming to Sudan and Egypt is going to be re-questioned. Um, Egypt had lobbied for hundreds of years to make, it, to make sure Ethiopia doesn't build the dam on the Blue Nile. Um, and uh, and Ethiopia basically waited until there was no government in Egypt to, base, to, to ex exercise the right of developing their hydroelectric uh, infrastructure. So where does music come in? The big question with water conflicts is not how much water there is to spread around, but how much resilience there is among the populations of the watershed to respond to water pressure, to respond to this conflict. Uh, if you live in a building and your neighbors uh, have a water problem and you, you know your neighbors, you're going to go and talk to them before you start fighting. If you don't know your neighbors and you don't care about your neighbors, you're going to start fighting, you're going to go to legal recourse, and, and that, that, ex that is exactly what happens with rivers. Um, so we had a brief opportunity before this water conflict turns into a big dispute uh, to change the minds of people living on this river because they haven't really made up their minds about each other yet. We're not talking about Israel-Palestine where people already know each other, familiar with each other's cultures and eat falafel and hummus. Uh, we're talking about people that don't know each other. Um, so we wanted to use music as a way to get people to rethink their sense of community, to think of the Nile as a valid sense of community. Now, this is not how I grew up in Egypt. I grew up knowing everything about the Arab world not knowing anything about Africa. And um, every time I interviewed someone for the Nile Project, I asked them how many countries ran, uh, the Nile ran through, and most people couldn't answer the question. It's 11 countries, if, in case you wonder. Um, but the, the, the realities of the Nile were kind of like really beyond the comprehension of most people living in this geography. Um, so the Nile is a very thin river compared to most other rivers, and that's one of the problems that we're dealing with this, with this water conflict. And the reality is really complex. Uh, Egypt, that is one of the most, the strongest economies, gets uh, very little water other than the Nile. Uh, so it relies on this water that, that's coming from the river for most of its food, for most of its electricity. And the other countries are saying, well, what about us? We've been kind of like stopped from kind of developing our infrastructure because Egypt is so worried about, you know, where this water uh, is going. And, and now we also deserve to 
build our infrastructure, to build our dams. Um, so it's, it's a complicated question that is really kind of, uh, you know, comes with a lot of colonial baggage, with a lot of uh, race baggage. Um, Egypt has never been the, uh, you know, the, the country that kind of like sided with all the sub-Saharan Africans uh, against the colonial powers. Um, so our process of approaching this musical model was really to kind of start with bringing musicians together from these different countries, uh, collaborate to combine all of these musical instruments and styles, and use that shift in that sense of community to start the conversation around the Nile. And the conversation started from a very different place when we didn't talk about water, when we started talking about music, about what these different people have shared for thousands of years, even though they didn't know about it. Um, and from there, that learning, that curiosity, is what incentivized different types of action, what we can do about it, how can we work on this, whether we're journalists or scientists or students or university professors. Uh, so this is kind of the model that we have developed. and. Um, we used uh, the U process, um, which some of you may be familiar with, to develop this residency, this musical residency uh, process where we started with musicians teaching each other about their different musical styles, so it was a music school. Uh, and that, that's where the creative process started and people would start in pairs and uh, trios working on different musical ideas and these ideas grew slowly so what we had at the end if you've seen the not project we came and performed at berkeley and stanford a few years ago um, was basically this collective of musicians where no one is, a, is a particularly a leader somebody might be a leader of one song but then they go back and they support their peers so you would see a vision of what looks like a community that is supporting each other um, and we didn't talk about it. So we didn't really sing about how you could protect your water or any of this. It, we, we sang about whatever the musicians wanted to sing about um, because at the end of the day, no one really understood what was going on on stage because everyone spoke in a different language. Um, <laughs> so we developed like all of these different ideas of how you can combine different musical systems to uh, create something that is bridging, musically speaking. And from that musical bridging, we start looking at metaphors for what this can be done, how this can be done uh, in other disciplines and styles. Um, this is just an example of scales from Egypt and Ethiopia that we combined. So we started doing this multimodal kind of musical collaboration where people were playing different scales from different countries. So it sounds Ethiopian to the Ethiopians, it sounds Egyptian to the Egyptians, uh, but it's actually something that's in between. Um, I can tell you more about it uh, later on, but this is just some background. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour. Bonjour. And when I say honne, you say respect. Honne. Respect. Honne. Respect. Honne means honor. When you come to a new space, you ask for permission to come in. Say honor. And then you respond by giving me you know, the approval to come in by saying respect. So one last time, one, respect. Thank you so very much. My name is Marlene Bastien. I'm uh, representing an organization in Little Haiti called FAM, Family Action Network Movement. We are a social advocacy group in Little Haiti. Little Haiti, um, where Haitian uh, refugees and, um, and immigrants who were set settled after they were released from detention centers uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. As a matter of fact, I thought that would be our first slide, but it's okay. So when Haitian refugees were coming in the late 70s, early 80s, they settled in a little Haiti, which was a very blighted, uh, drug-infested, and prostitution prone area. As a matter of fact, they were let uh, out there because it was really looking bad. It, 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 it was really a blighted area, all right? These are the, the refugees when they arrived. And U.S. government uh, implemented uh, a, a, an exclusion, exclusionary uh, proposal where Haitians, you know, would uh, go to court every day at the Quam detention camp 
and they would be, um, uh, we would be uh, going to, from one courtroom to, to the other to try to afford them of the basic rights of due process. In order for us to get the Haitian refugees out of detention centers, some of them would be there for, for months, sometimes years. I represented a young Haitian uh, refugee who was uh, at Com Detention Center, which was believed at the time to be one of the worst in the US. He was there for 18 months and then he was rearrested because he didn't receive his letter asking him to go to court and then he spent another, another 12 months and then he was deported to Haiti. So we had to organize rallies on the ground uh, to make sure uh, and then go to court uh, all the way to the Supreme Court so that the Haitian refugees could be out and that, so that their basic rights of due process could be respected. And it wasn't easy. So this is a picture at Com Detention Camp. Uh, this were where people were gathered in mass, men, women, and children, even pregnant women, in one big compound, right? Uh, sometimes with few interpreters, they could not communicate. Uh, of course, uh, we, every day there were articles uh, talking about the, 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 the double standard in treatment, because at the time we realized that Cubans were also coming en masse, where, whereas the Cubans received the red carpet treatment, where they were released after a few days, they got their work permit uh, soon after. Um, within a year, they became permanent residents, and then within three years, they became U.S. citizens. Haitians lingered in detention centers. So, of course, we had supporters uh, coming, um, uh, writing about the double standard in the treatment at that time. But while we were uh, fighting to get uh, the Haitians out to make sure that their basic rights of due process uh, uh, was respected because these Haitians were coming from the dictatorship at that time. The Duvalier dictatorship was one of the, was of the worst dictatorships in modern history, right? The Haitians were qualified as economic refugees versus political refugees. So while we were organizing to get them out of detentions, like I said, locally and then and, and, uh, working through the courts, we had another social uh, problems in our hands, right? And then and, and, um, I'm gonna talk about what's going on now and I'm gonna uh, come back to what we had to do to uh, address these uh, social problems. So um, um, Little Haiti, like I said, was a blighted area. And as most immigrants do, when the Haitians you know, settle in Little Haiti, they organize, they build uh, businesses, they build radio stations, uh, they build cultural centers, they organize cult cultural centers and they transformed it into this wonderful, uh, dynamic, culturally inclusive neighborhood. But uh, lately, for the past 15 years, Little Haiti is believed to be the fastest gentrified area in the nation today. You might ask, why? Why so many people you know, want to come to Little Haiti? Why developers are coming from all over the world, as far as China, lately Venezuela, to buy spaces and land in Little Haiti? And it's not like they come and they want to develop with the people that, who live in Little Haiti. They come and then they are forcing people out. So there are three major developments. Little Haiti is a very restricted area because we, we organized for 16 years to, uh, to officialize the name of Little Haiti, right? It took us uh, uh, 16 years. And then we officially, officially organized it June uh, 27, 2016. And then now we have three major developments coming in. One of them is Magic City. Let me explain that. If you are a developer, right, and you can organize nine acres of land, you can ask the city of Miami to change the zoning code so you can build by height, right? Now, Little Haiti is zoned for T5, meaning that you can only build up to five floors. Even though in Miami 21, there, is, there, 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 is a, there, there are rules of, of reg and regulations you can bypass to build 10th to 11th floors, but that's that, that's it. So Magic City, for example, has 15 acres of land, and they want the city to change the zoning code so they can build in the middle of the, of the residential neighborhood up to, up to 25 floors. So what did we do when, when we had that social problem? The social problem at that time was that uh, Haitian refugees were coming out and the, chi the Haitian children were being beaten all the time when they go to school, when they were walking on the streets by no other than uh, African-American children. At that time, in the, the late uh, 90s, uh, early uh, uh, 2000s, uh, around 2007 to 2008, we realized that we had a big problems on our hands. In our centers, all, every day we had children coming with the parents with bruise and, uh, bruises and stuff. How did, how did we solve this problem? We organized what we call T. 
te means T in English. What we did was we realized that children are not born racist, right? Children are, are not born with, with, with a lot of bias, right? We realized that in order to solve that problem, it was important for us to change the narrative about the way Haitians think of African Americans and vice versa. When we talked to some Haitians at that time, oh, African Americans are lazy, they are all on welfare. When we talked to African Americans, oh, the Haitians come here to, talk, to take our jobs. So what we did at that time, so that we can transform the uh, others and aliens and others into the we, we organized what we call the day where we put African American children and uh, uh, women, African American women and Haitian women in, in rooms at their homes. They met at their homes, they shared tea, they shared food, and then they shared the history. When Haitians learned about African American struggle, the civil rights struggles, when they saw pictures that some of the mothers shared about horses trampling African Americans who were fighting for equity at that time, when they saw police, uh, police officers beating down on African Americans, the, the, the tears started to, to flow. When African Americans' mom who met at different homes. One week they met at a, a Haitian American home. The next week they met at, at, a, at a Haitian family home. When they heard about the Haitian history, how Haitians organized into maroons to fight the biggest army at that time, how the slaves were, be, were being treated in Haiti, how after Haiti was freed, it made sure that other nations also are freed. It came here to the US to take 1,000 African Americans back to Haiti to give them land work. The, the, the river of, of tears widened, and guess what? Whereas we could not, we could not, you know, build bridges by talking on the radio about, about uh, what we had in common, that Haitians and African Americans should be tactical uh, uh, allies, and yet, you know, the children are fighting. What, what changed, what started to change the behaviors was that, that coming together, that bonding, that shared history and sharing food. And when they got to the food, they say, oh, it's almost the same food. <laughs> we, we, are, we are one after all. So what are we doing now? Come to, I'm, I'm going to end. Come to now, fast forward, 2019, where we have a group of people who worked and earned $2, $3 an hour in the late 70s, early 80s to build their dream home. And suddenly, they are being pushed out. What do we do? We say that we, we have to find a way to bring people together because we used to think that the reason why Little Haiti is, it has so much allure, right, was because it was close to downtown Miami, close to the two airports, and then close to Fisher Our Island. We call it the city of the extremes, where in Little Haiti, in Overtown, which is African-American neighborhood, in Liberty City, which is an African-American neighborhood, you know, it is close where people make uh, minimum wage, right? And then 10 minutes, 10 minutes drive, you have Fisher Island. We thought that the allure was that. But we found out, unbeknown to us, the allure is because Little Haiti is positioned on elevated land. And then this fact was hidden from us. We only found out three years ago. And then now we're finding out not only Little Haiti, but Liberty City is also, uh, uh, being, uh, is also positioned on elevated land. So what we are doing, we, could not, we cannot use the tea, the tea anymore. And I know some of you, you know, when tea, tea party, no way, guys. So we were doing canvassing recently to plan, to prepare for a big hearing in the city of Miami. And then, and then our, we were talking to, you know, some of the little Haiti residents and said, what's going on? What can we do? And then one of the little Haiti residents told me, Malen, you know, you need to go tipa, tipa. You need to go step by step, step by step. And you need to go to these people's house, right? And then you go to one house after another, after another. And then next thing you know, you will have a big rassemblée, meaning a big gathering. So instead of the tea now, huh? we don't want anything to do with the tea party. Instead of the tea, we're going we're gonna, to uh, implement the tipa, tipa, organizing, right, right, step-by-step step organizing, uh, bringing together the people of Little Haiti, bringing together the people of Liberty City, bringing together, which is also being gentrified, the people of Overtown, uh, which uh, another area that is being uh, gentrified, building together the people of West Coconut Grove, another area that is being gentrified and from what we understand it's going on all around the nation. 
people are coming to move people out, force people out, so that they can build high rises. So we go, what we're going to what we've been implementing is the TIPA, TIPA organizing, and hopefully we will get this big rassemble where people understand that they are in the same boat, they belong together, and they need to organize to fight back these big developers, what we call predatory development, because if you are not developing with the people, you are developing against the people. So this big rassemble of the different neighborhoods will organize together to fight back and to say, if we build it by God, we have the right to live in it. We are not against development, but we are against predatory development. We are not against development, we are for inclusive and participatory development, which we will really uh, 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 do by tipa tipa organizing and a big rassemble. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I say namaste to all of you? Namaste. Yeah. Um, I think I have uh, this utopian idea ever since I was a kid of this we that includes all living beings. Um, and I didn't know how to actualize it. Um, so I want to share with you a bit of my journey and uh, four key insights that we've learned through Service Space. So in my journey, oh, these were supposed to come one at a time, but in my journey, I started with giving. And as I gave, as I did small acts of kindness, uh, I realized I was bridging with other people. Um, and initially I thought I was giving, but over time I realized I couldn't give without receiving. And then, uh, that's a photo of me just as proof that I had hair. Uh, <laughs> once, uh, my wife and I walked across India and we ate whatever food was offered and slept wherever place was offered. And what we realized is that you may be giving in one way and receiving in another, and it's really impossible to keep track. So all you can do is just dance. Um, <laughs> And that's a, it's a, as an organizing principle, that's a very profound thing. And so well, I run an organization called Service Space. For the last 20 years, we've been doing a whole series of experiments uh, it, you know, in the field of generosity. But really, I mean, most people will start with a big idea, big money, big offices. And our thought was, if you really want to flip it, like turn the whole thing upside down instead of doing incremental things. So instead of big idea, we had small acts. Instead of big money, we said we were not going to do any fundraising, just rely purely on gratitude uh, and big offices. Instead of that, let's just do all volunteers. And if you look at this in year number one, nobody's going to invite you to give a talk, right? Like this is like, <laughs> oh, that's cute. Yeah, my two-year-old, uh, you know, does a lemonade stand. Um, but what we learned is usually you start with impact and then you say, hey, this is what I want to create in the world. Here are the projects. I'm going to hire some folks and maybe they have some inner transformation. Right? But what we ended up doing is we started with that interchange first and invariably you do an act of kindness for anybody, you're going to create a bridge. And those bridges, invariably, you'll have loads and loads of people. As you have people, what are they going to do? Sit around and look at each other? No, they're going to create change. And so we had so many projects, and those projects created impact, turned the whole thing upside down. So if you ask me, you know, we, this is at one of our retreats in India. If you say, well, what are the things you've learned? Uh, I would say these four progressive steps, and the fourth one is really what I want to leave you with, uh, but they're progressive, and I think it starts with this very basic idea, but it's so counterculture in our time today, that everyone is good at something. Right? The way we interview is exactly the opposite of this. You're not saying, oh, how, what are you good at? You're saying, what do I need? And that becomes very uh, dangerous. So I, I can explain more, but really Einstein says it best. He says, everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it's going to live its whole life believing it's stupid. And if we were to ask people, you know, what, what is the foundation of creating change, all too often you hear the biggest lack is money, um, and, and then we fight for it. And the way money is designed, it breeds a kind of scarcity. Uh, but I think this is a different question. This is what are other forms of capital, right? Do we have markets for 
you know, culture capital. I mean, if stories are the currency, what are we going to do uh, to circulate those stories, just as we do so much to propagate financial currency? And like that, you can go around, you know, time is such an in invaluable asset and attention. I mean, you know, that little dog's got his ears up. Um, <laughs> And I, I was on a, you know, advisory panel for uh, President Obama, and, and we got him to say, hey, man, capital is not just financial. There's a lot more to it. But we need to design systems that encourage these alternate forms of capital. Um, I think as we do that, the second big thing is, what are you going to do with everyone's gifts? And I think what everyone wants to do innately, and there's a lot of research backing this up, is that everyone wants to give. Everyone can be great at giving. And we've heard people like Martin Luther King Jr. say everyone can be great because everyone can serve. Uh, but really, like at any point, even in this room, if we said we need like 10 volunteers, you create a strong context, you will have 20. But do we have the systems to use those 20? All too often you go to organizations, they say, yeah, we have lots of volunteers, but we re what we really need is more fundraisers. Because everything is funneled through this very narrow means. So, so if we really start to mobilize people's gifts and, and engage them, then I think you get to the third insight, which is that not only do people have gifts to give, but as that giving gets connected, we create a gift ecology. We create a very different way of being with each other. And we don't even know how to pattern this, so we've done a bunch of different experiments. Karma Kitchen, some of you might have heard of it. You walk into this restaurant, it's in 23 places around the world, including here in uh, Berkeley, we ran it for uh, seven years here. You, you walk in, and at the end of your meal, your check reads zero. It's zero because someone before you has paid for you, and you are trusted to pay forward for those after you. And most people look at that and say, hey, that's crazy, that's not gonna work. Right. Harvard came to study it, and they said, this is crazy, not going to work. For us, that was a badge of honor. Right? Harvard couldn't understand it. <laughs> UC Berkeley then came in and did research on this, and the title of this, at Haas, uh, the title of this seminal paper under academic scrutiny that said, paying more when paying for others. Because you're tapping into not just financial capital, but so many other motivations uh, that are embedded in it. But what's most important is not like that people pay more. I mean, that's what B-schools are going to say. But what actually happens is when these people get connected in generosity in this kind of an inter interlocking way, it creates a new intelligence. It creates totally different patterns. It creates different kind of behavior in that space. And we've seen it with tens of thousands of people. And this is a guy that applies the same principles uh, to a magazine. He says, I don't want to put price tags, only offerings of gratitude. Woman, this woman runs an uh, acupuncture clinic in this way. And this guy in India, one of my close friends, runs a rickshaw. And he says, you sit in my rickshaw and there's no meter. You pay forward for the person after you. And everyone says, does it work? He says, uh, well, you know, I, by and large it evens out. But that's the wrong ledger. This is where I ask people how they felt sitting in my rickshaw. And this is not Bill Gates doing philanthropy. This is a rickshaw driver who needs all the money from that day. And he's betting that if I treat you with love, love will beget more love. And he says, who's behind it? Which organization? He says, no organization. It's me and my belief in love. You want to step up and do the same thing? You could too. That's empowering. And I think what that gets us to, these usually go in successive order, but it's, uh, we don't have the animations here. But if you lead with inner transformation, you arrive at this idea that everyone is good at something. If when everyone has a gift, we see that everyone can be great at giving. When those small acts of love get connected, you have a gift ecology, a very different field of intelligence. And then the last thing is that if a, such a gratitude network emerges, we realize that everyone is connected to everything. And that is not utopia if you have the foundation of those three. It's a very real thing. I come from the land of Gandhi, I'm very connected to Gandhi, and we talk about Gandhi as Gandhi 1.0 was one of him and many of us, one to many. In India we had a say, Gandhi's spiritual successor was a guy named Vinoba, he walked village to village for a land gift movement, and that was one to one, and that's Gandhi 2.0. And Gandhi 3.0, what both of them talked about, is this, he says, what comes up as a fountain will come down as water drops, many to many. Another way to look at this is, you know, in a room full of, I wish I had animations, then you would be shocked, but now you already see the punchline. In a room full of 50 people in a TV model, 
right? You have 50 connections. Right now, we have one too many connections. In the telephone network model, you have 1,225 connections. In the internet era, in just a room full of 50 people, you have 100 million trillion connections. This is just network theory. So this idea of a lot of people are like, oh, we should all connect with each other. Man, that's only get, gonna get you to 1225. How do you unlock the 100 million trillion? And really, I think what it tells us is you go from centralized to decentralized to distributed. And that's a lot of bridging. And the big idea that I wanna leave you with is that I think if you go and tell people from this par in the centralized paradigm, where you say, what is the leadership? that leadership is, looks very different than in a distributed paradigm. And we don't have people who know how to lead that. And so we decide, we call it from leadership to laddership. And these are very significant differences. You go from centralized to distributed, planning and executing to search and amplify. You know, from the quantity of ties to the quality of ties. It's not just how big your Facebook following is. Those are cheap ties. How do you go into deep ties and those deep ties I think are ignited through love. I think they're ignited through generosity. I think they're ignited through m building bridges. So I hope we can all talk about this. And even in this room, we have millions and mil trillions of connections that are possible in this room. I hope we can all just come together and, and even explore through a heart of generosity. Thank you. Great presentation. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Let's give it up one more time for our panelists, Victor, Marlene, Mina, and Nippon. And thank you all for choosing this workshop. I hope it was worth it. <laughs>